Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Vanity, pride, self-esteem, and narcissism tend to get a, a bad press. Nobody likes being told that they're vain or proud or stuck up or conceited. And yet, um, the picture is, as I argue, nuanced. There's proper pride. We don't talk about proper vanity or proper narcissism, but we do talk about proper pride. And there's certainly proper self-esteem. Uh, indeed, there are whole psychological movements, or have been psychological movements, They're particularly prominent in the 90s and early uh, decade of the first decade of this century, which thought that uh, you know a key to social welfare was to increase people's self-esteem. Milton is a bit down on vanity, but he says in a rather quaint passage, which I rather liked. But there is yet a more ingenuous and noble degree of honest shame, or call it, if you will, an esteem whereby men bear an inward reverence towards their own person. And if the love of God is a fire sent from heaven to be ever kept alive upon the altar of our hearts, if that be the first principle of all godly and virtuous actions in men, this pious and just honoring of ourselves is the second, and may be thought of as the radical moisture and fountainhead whence every laudable and worthy enterprise issues forth. So... Basically, if you despise yourself or you hold yourself in contempt or you're uh, uh, the sort of Christian hu humble saint, the person of just unbridled humility, uh, then you're not likely to be fit for great en endeavors, great things, or even for having that kind of pride which would prevent you from stooping to low behavior, to lies or hypocrisy or flattery or any of the things that we tend to think of as pretty bad. So Milton here is uh, um, by no means down on a healthy self-esteem. In fact, he thinks it's second only to godliness as a, uh, a fountainhead of, of virtue. So what I argue is that um, the picture is nuanced. Um, as so often in, when you're thinking about traits which either get a good or a bad press, the picture is going to be Aristotelian. Aristotle famously argued for the mean you want not too much and not too little of many traits which count as virtues. So, for example, you want people to be courageous in pursuing various ends, which it might be difficult to pursue, tempting to give up. But you don't want them to be, on the one hand, rash. That's madly courageous, indifferent to danger of poor judgment. Uh, on the other hand, you don't want them to be timid or pusillanimous. You want a mean. You want a, something in between. Um, and the same goes for uh, many of these things. However, I do think that uh, things can get out of hand. The working title of this book was actually Because You're Worth It, the famous L'Oreal advert, which has run for about 20 years or more, I think. Where every time I saw that ad, I was puzzled by my own reactions. Uh, my own reaction was this kind of visceral hatred and despair and... Uh, and uh, sort, of ten, sort of impulse to commit suicide. Um, <laughs> anyhow, the reason I eventually hit on the, um, the self-understanding of why I felt so, as I say, viscerally miserable on seeing that L'Oreal ad was um, perhaps twofold. Um, one was that a lot of the allure seemed to arise, as it often does in the fashion industries, from, not from, as it were, a persona in an advert smiling at us or encouraging us or showing sort of human reciprocity, but the model, the persona in the advert is often sort of portrayed as in a sort of narcissistic trance um, that is above us, away from us, uh, not offering the kind of human exchange that a smile would offer, but somehow lost in a trance of his or her, usually her, um, own narcissism. Um, and that struck me as very puzzling, because why should that be an attractive trait? Why should advertisers uh, find that a kind of projection that 
we might, that might lure us into buying their product. Um, if you meet somebody who's narcissistic, well, narcissistic people can be charming, but to be charming, they have to pretend not to be narcissistic, um, like Tony Blair. Um, <laughs> and, um, and the overt narcissist, the somebody who just is haughty or arrogant or wrapped up in themselves, who denies us any human interchange, is, of course, incredibly unattractive. It's an unappealing trait. So it seemed to me very strange to try to understand why this was the attractive persona, the persona that's lured, that's used to lure people. And I think what I discovered, or what I felt I discovered, the, anyhow, the diagnosis I offered of it for all, was that the fantasy that the advert is building on, the fantasy that the success, enormous worldwide success of the campaign, is one that actually works on a lie. Um, the idea of that is to be had by the would-be consumer, the potential consumer, is that you're not worth it. You're worth nothing. Um, or I'm worth nothing. But you could become worth something if you bought the shampoo. You could, as it were, start to join the persona on that pedestal from which the persona doesn't have to make compromises with people like you. The haughtiness, in other words, the arrogance, the, um, the sense of being above you and indifferent to you that the uh, model is projecting. That works by, as it were, putting you, the potential consumer, down to a place where you think, you know, I can't be on that pedestal. But perhaps if I, join, if, if I buy the product, I can. Perhaps I can get up there. Perhaps I can become self-sufficient, become a creature of higher self-esteem, uh, somebody who is uh, sufficiently elevated uh, in order to be able to uh, be indifferent to people like myself as I am. So my diagnosis of the anger was very much that it was a response to the implicit lie that I thought I'd diagnosed in that kind of advertisement. Anyhow, this led me to think about things like narcissism and um, to reflect on narcissism, vanity, pride, self-esteem, the whole family of emotions that are uh, concerned with ourselves. I looked at the philosophical tradition and, of course, there's a great, uh, a great many people have moralized about these things. Usually, I thought rather simplistically, you can easily find writing which dumps on vanity, which dumps on self-esteem. Um, Iris Murdoch offered a fairly catch-all diagnosis of bad stuff in human life, which was you can't escape what she called the avaricious tentacles of the self. She thought that self-consciousness and self, uh, an egoism, um, selfishness, ordinary commonplace selfishness, were kind of worms in the bud. And if you could lose those, you would achieve uh, almost an artistic vision, an objective vision. You'd see the world as it ought to be seen. You'd obtain an objective vision. And this was a kind of um, emblem of the way we ought to be in the world. You forget yourself. You forget your own concerns. You forget your own selfish desires. And you're taken out of yourself. And there's something right about it. But there's also something, I think, wrong about it because it's by no means obvious that, say, ordinary selfishness gets in the way of objective vision. Um, and to illustrate this, I, gave the I give the story in the book of um, 1968, uh, a country auction in Somerset, um, where uh, there were some paintings being auctioned, and it was just an ordinary little country sale. Uh, but a uh, a number of dealers from London came down, and they saw that one of the paintings on show was most probably by the Sienese artist, Trecento artist, Duccio di Boninsegna, and therefore was worth a fortune. Um, so they repaired to the nearest pub and formed an agreement not to bid against each other, and they bought the painting for £2,400, quite a lot of money in... Uh, 1968, but they promptly sold it to the National Gallery for £140,000. Um, so their vision was excellent. They saw the painting for exactly what it was. They saw it objectively in the sense that they got the attribution right, 
whereas other people who'd seen the painting had probably because of the humble surroundings, they not even dreamt that it might be as somebody as distinguished as, jo as uh, Duccio. Um, so there's uh, selfishness, and of course, uh, the prospect of gain, the prospect of a good bargain, motivates people to look very keenly at things. Um, if I'm not in the car market, I'm not, in, I'm not buying a car, I'll potter past car dealerships without looking. Uh, if I'm desperate to buy a car and looking for something good, I'll look a lot harder. So it was very unclear to me what Iris Murdoch's actual target was. Furthermore, it seemed to me she confused in a number of passages self-consciousness, ordinary self-consciousness, with selfishness. And those are two very different things. I mean, an adolescent, for example, might typically be very self-conscious. Adolescents don't have the goal to stand up in front of audiences like I am. Um, and not blush and uh, twiddle their thumbs and generally um, show marked symptoms of unease because they're, the worm of self-consciousness is particularly um, active during those years and the cure is to grow out of it. Um, but it doesn't follow that the adolescent is typically selfish during those years. Uh, in fact, young adults are often much less selfish than their grown-up counterparts. Uh, who've lost a lot of the self-consciousness. So again, you've got to be quite careful with these notions. They require kind of kid glove handling. I just thought I'd say a little bit about the various notions. I, I mentioned at the beginning that there's such a thing as proper pride. Um, and I quoted Milton saying that a just self-esteem was a jolly good thing and motivated uh, lots of actions that people would otherwise not feel able to undertake. Um, but there's no such thing as proper vanity. So what's the, you know, what are the root ideas here? Well, I think the difference between pride and vanity, uh, it preoccupied quite a number of people in the 18th century, actually, especially Adam Smith. Uh, Adam Smith's usually thought of as a sort of guru of monetarism, free markets, everything that's wrong with us these days. But before he wrote The Wealth of Nations, which is the justification for that view of him, he wrote a book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And it's an absolutely wonderful, almost an encyclopedia of moral notions. And these are largely, in Adam Smith's handling, psychological notions. And so amongst the questions he asks himself is what's the distinction between pride and vanity? And uh, the conclusion he comes to, which I think is certainly a large part of the truth, is that pride is... Uh, you can have a, prou a proud person may, as it were, not be prepared to let himself down. And you can be proud of an achievement which you can regard as an achievement, a success which is a genuine success. So uh, the proud person is satisfied if he's satisfied that, or she is satisfied that what she does uh, deserves approbation. It's worth the approval of other people. And you can have that feeling even if there's nobody around to approve of it. If Robinson Crusoe um, is a proud person and he sets himself to do some wood carving on his desert island, uh, he might feel pleased because the wood carving is good. It's come out as it should have. It's, uh, it's a success. And an artist might feel that they've let themselves down if they haven't managed to achieve what they feel they're capable of. So the proud person is vulnerable to a sort of self-criticism, a mortification that arises from an awareness that what he thinks deserves praise actually may not. The vain person, by comparison, doesn't care whether what he did was good or not. What he cares about is to harvest the applause of other people. Uh, as long as he gets it, that's okay. It doesn't matter if the people who applaud them are actually incompetent judges, are... Uh, uh, in some way deceived about the quality of what he did, or are in other ways perhaps dishonest, perhaps they're just flatterers. It doesn't matter to the vain person. The reward is harvesting the, the approval and the approbation. To the proud person, it's not. It's doing something that's worthy of approval or approbation, regardless of whether you get it. So the proud person can be quite satisfied with his achievement, even if nobody sees it. The vain person can't. The vain person needs the approval. 
So vanity turns out as a kind of greed for the approval of other people. I think eventually, though, the picture becomes a little more complicated than Adam Smith gives if you think of a term like conceit. Um, Anthony Grayling told me that Freddie Eyre, who was one of his mentors, for those of you who are too young in the audience to know who Freddie Eyre was, a very uh, notorious philosopher from the middle of the 20th century. Um, and Freddie Eyre, uh, according to Anthony, Freddie Eyre said to him, um, it's true that I'm a vain person, but I'm not conceited. <laughs> and, um, and of course, that's rather puzzling because Normally, we don't make much of a distinction. I think the distinction is, as I say, if, if vanity is a greed, a kind of excessive desire for the approbation of other people, um, I think with conceit, you're tipping into narcissism. And the great thing about narcissism is, again, you don't need other people. The narcissist is, as it were, invulnerable in their own self-image. That is, uh, that's beautifully illustrated in the Greek myth. In the Greek myth, Narcissus is the Greek shepherd boy, of course. He, uh, as everybody knows, he's uh, solitary. He's just looking after his sheep in the mountains. He comes across a pond, has the bad luck to look into it. And when he looks into it, he sees an image and falls in love. Um, what's not so commonly, and of course, eventually, he withers away and dies out of unrequited love for himself. Um, What's not so commonly known about the myth is that he does have a companion um, during this otherwise solipsistic reverie or dream. Uh, and his companion is the nymph Echo. And I love this aspect of the myth. Echo was a perfectly decent young lady. Um, but alas, she had the fatal habit of chattering. And her chatter, she was a Twitterati before her time. Um, her chattering so outraged the goddess Juno that Juno condemned her only ever to repeat the last thing said to her. That's why she's called Echo. Um, and so she became a sort of insubstantial voice. But she is Narcissus's companion. And I think the great insight that the myth uh, includes at that point is that um, for the narcissist, there is a voice in his own head admiring himself, but it's his own voice. It's basically the reflection of his own self-approbation, self-esteem, self-love. Um, I think conceit is a point at which you tip from vanity, which does require the applause of other people, to narcissism where it's actually no longer necessary because you're absolutely invulnerable in your own self-conceit, your, your own approval. I want to ask a little bit about smartphone culture, if that's oh, okay. Yes. Sure. Because the internet, more broadly, um, is a world where you think it's about everything else, the whole universe, other people. But the way we sort of enter it and you know, negotiate with it is through our self-concerns and our you know, looking for our number of followers and likes and so forth. Is your view that these technologies sort of somehow amplify the, the traits of the self and, and narcissism, or do you think that the trait is just universal and time, you know, perennial, and it doesn't matter what the technologies are? I, th I, I'm, I incline much more to the second. I think that the traits are pretty universal, and technology is at, is at, their, at their service. I was quite amused. As the book was impressed, too late for me to, to bring up the anecdote, there was the, the famous selfie that uh, David Cameron, um, the Danish Prime Minister Heli, uh, what's Obama, um, yeah, yeah, sure. and Obama took at Nelson Mandela's funeral service. And you think, well, that's pretty bad. You know, if you're at Nelson Mandela's funeral service, you shouldn't really be going click, click to yourself. I remember as a, as a student going to Sunion, the great temple near to Athens in, in, in Greece, and uh, there's Lord Byron, scratched his name in it. Um, you know, uh, and of course there are uh, graffiti of that kind. You know, Kilroy was here all over the world. The Taj Mahal, I think, is particularly um, uh, defaced by them. Um, so it's a, evidently a universal trait. And as it goes, taking a selfie is at least less destructive than carving a name into the Taj Mahal. I think what has changed in our time, certainly changed in my lifetime, is the kind of 
greed is good culture, um, it seems to me that it's not only a decline, therefore, of public spirit, public service, any such notion, but it's also the loss of any kind of shame or embarrassment about pushing yourself forward. I mean, uh, it used to be, as it were, a criticism of somebody to say they're on an ego trip. Um, nowadays, it seems to be almost expected of people that they should be on an ego trip. And the self-esteem industry I mentioned at the beginning, the sort of Californian self-esteem industry, obviously promotes that kind of uh, self-consciousness.